Scripture lesson comes from Luke, the third chapter, beginning at verse 15. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, and John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, as we come to you this morning, we ask your Holy Spirit to descend once more upon our hearts and our lives, that we might recognize once more your claim and your call upon each of us. We are thankful for your great grace that has brought us to this place. And we pray, dear God, that you might continue to strengthen and guide us in our spiritual walk, that we might learn more of your will for our lives, and we might be open to the teaching that the Holy Spirit might bring to each of us. Bless us with your presence, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today is the first Sunday after Epiphany. If you remember your Christian year, Epiphany is on January the 6th. And the first Sunday after Epiphany is always called the Baptism of the Lord Sunday. For that is the day in which we celebrate and recognize what took place when Jesus was baptized. Now, I can already see your eyes sort of glazing over, and you're thinking, oh no, here we go again, another one of those ritual sermons that I don't understand, and we'll get through this. Let me guarantee you, yes, we will get through this. (laughs) But I hope it's more than just uh, an endurance. I hope that we can open our minds to what is actually taking place here, that Jesus was baptized, and that we as baptized Christians are a part of the family of God. And that family as God is bigger than denominations. It's bigger than nationality. It's it's bigger than, than anything else. It brings us all together from around the world. We become brothers and sisters in Christ. Not because we've joined the right church, but because we have been baptized. Now, I have done a lot of baptisms in my life. I've done them... In swimming pools, I've done them in Kentucky Lake, I've done them in Soldier's Creek. Now that's interesting when you have a baptism in the creek in the summertime. You're not only dealing with the Holy Spirit, but you're dealing with water snakes as well. It adds a little bit to the service. You always have someone standing on guard. Baptisms are part of our lives. Most of my baptisms have been infant baptisms, and we're going to have another one here today in the late service. If you wanted to be immersed in this church, we have a stock tank. We can bring it out, fill it full of water, and we can dunk you, as they say. Baptisms are interesting. Sometimes I wonder now, when you go down, can I get you back up? And there's always the story of the preacher that was baptizing in the creek, and as he took the woman under the water, her wig floated away. (laughs) There are all kinds of stories. The best one I heard was the little four-year-old boy that had been baptized one Sunday morning, and he was driving home with his uh, family after church, sitting in the back seat. Suddenly, he started crying. And his mother turned around to him and said, son, what's wrong with you? 
What's, what's wrong? I mean, you were baptized today. What could possibly be wrong? And the little boy said, the preacher said, I was going to be raised in a Christian home and I want to stay with you guys. So what is baptism? Is there something magical or mystical about this water? If I pray the right prayer, does it change its molecular structure and become something else? No. There's nothing magical or mystical about it. It's a symbol, much like all the other symbols we have in our lives. That diploma on your wall is a symbol of what you've experienced in education. The wedding band ring that you wear is a symbol of a commitment and a vow that you made. Now, will that keep you from doing wrong things? Will it keep you from falling into adultery? No. There's nothing magical or mystical about it. But it is a symbolic understanding of the commitment that we have made to each other and baptism is a commitment that we have made to Christ. But more than that, it is a commitment that God has made to us through Christ first. And so therefore, it's not our baptism. There is no such thing as a Methodist baptism. We're baptized in the church universal. And so therefore, we recognize baptisms from other denominations and, and groups because it's not ours. And yet there are some churches that if you join them, you've got to be rebaptized. Baptism is really, first of all, an understanding of how God sees us in ways that we don't see ourselves. He sees something in us that says to us, that we're important and that we're included. And sometimes it's mystifying. Have you ever looked at couples and wonder what they saw in each other? I know you have. I'm looking at some of you today and wondering about that. <laughs> Just what in the world? Did she think she was getting? <laughs> or what in, I mean, you, you have those thoughts, don't you? I do. When I was in campus ministry, we would have young people fall in love with each other and all, they'd all want to get married. And oh, more times than not, I thought, Lord, these things will never work. But they did. And they've gone on to have long and happy marriages. Well, long marriages anyway. <laughs> in other words, when you fall in love with something, you see something that no one else can see. And because of that, you're willing to make a commitment to that person, even though your friends and your neighbors and your family may be saying, what are you doing? God sees something within each and every one of us that gives him the desire to be in relationship not with just a few, not with just the chosen, whoever those are, but with all of us. And because of that, we can experience God's grace and presence in our lives because God sees within us things that perhaps we don't even see within ourselves. He sees our hurts and our pain. He sees our fears. And we live in such a fearful world right now. But God sees all of that and wants us to understand that he can help us not only to be healed from our afflictions, but to be stronger and to face all of those difficulties and fears that come upon us. And sometimes the rest of the world will 
turn their back on us. But God doesn't. God continues to love us. God continues to seek us. God continues to search for us. And through baptism, we can experience that covenant with God. We say to God, yes, I want to be claimed. I want to be yours. And we follow him. When John proclaimed that Jesus would be the one coming, he knew that he could only do so much, but there was someone coming who had more strength and more power and more ability. There is only so much we can do. And ultimately, if we're going to be the church, it's not going to be because of our efforts. It will be because of the efforts of God working through us that enables us to be the kind of church that we need to be. But sometimes we look at our level and our skills and our abilities and we then begin to put limits on what God can do. And we make a mistake when we do. For you see, God not only claims us, but he also calls us. He calls us to mission and ministry. He calls us to realizing that the world is bigger than just ourselves. That we come to him when we understand that God is at work in our hearts and our lives and that we can, we can be of service to others. And there are a multitude of ways. Every time we have a call to action in this church, it's an opportunity for people to get involved in some mission or ministry. If you read the bulletin this morning, you will find ample opportunity to get involved in something if you want to. And you might say, well, there's nothing in there that I want to do. Well, there's nothing to keep you from doing it. Because we will help and we'll support and we'll encourage if you're willing to do it. Now, the problem I have is when people come to me and say, preacher, you ought to. You know, you ought to do this, or you ought to do that. And listen, I'm well aware of all the oughts I have in my life. I've got plenty of them. And I can work all day long and not even be halfway down the list. But you know, ultimately, God is asking us, what are we doing? How are we participating? One of the classic examples of someone who has volunteered their time and given themselves to other has been Jimmy Carter. A man who has selflessly given of himself when he could have sat back and taken life easy and lived a life of retirement and playing golf every day and not worrying about anything. And now even into his 90s, he's still volunteering for Habitat for Humanity to try to help others. It's amazing how that works in our lives, that we can find our ministry, not because we become preachers or missionaries or public speakers. We become missionaries whenever we find a way in which we can help others. And maybe that's with Habitat. Maybe it's with a sewing machine. Maybe it's with feeding people. Maybe it's with cleaning up after disaster. Maybe it's helping others that simply need a helping hand. Speaking of habitat, there's a story of a man who come, came home from Vietnam and he was stressed out beyond belief and he had all kinds of problems. He couldn't keep a job. But he had carpentry skills. And so he found a place where he could volunteer some of his service, some of his time, just to have something to do and at that particular city, they were building six houses at once. Quite a project. And he volunteered to help. The director of the project said, if you will help, we'll let you sleep in one of the houses at night, and you can sort of be security as well. So the guy brought his sleeping bag, and he slept in the house and watch the property every evening. It took him a year to build all of those houses. 
And once they got them all finished and they were ready to move in the, the new people, the director came up to the man and handed him a set of keys. And he said, what's this? And he said, this last house that we built, we've decided to give to you. Suddenly he realized that what God had given to him was more than just a place to work. But he had given him an opportunity to find a mission in his life. So he found a home, but he also found a mission. And for the past 30 years, he has worked on several habitat houses each year, volunteering to make a difference in someone else's life. Baptism isn't a ritual that's just about us. It's a claiming and a calling to be a part of the world, to be a part of the church, to be a part of a community, and to find out who we are. You all remember your anniversary date when you got married? I hope you do. At least once a year that you remember it and get it right. On this first Sunday of Epiphany, it's the day that we remember our baptism. We remember what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, and because of that, we understand that we are claimed and we are called to be in this world making a difference for Jesus. And so I invite you. Remember your baptism and live into the calling that God has placed before each and every one. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.